yeah yeah no as in when it's comfortable i am here sir hello Okay, come, sir. Okay. Hearty good morning to all. I extend a very warm welcome to all to the twenty fourth annual lecture of the postgraduate and research department of economics of Mathoma College, Thiruvan. The annual lecture is a prestigious event of the department which has been conducted continuously since 1998 when the department became a research center of Mahatma Gandhi University College we as department thank god almighty for strengthening us to organize this academic activity successfully and meaningfully all throughout these years This year too we have been able to organize this academic venture in online mode amidst the covid-19 pandemic I once again welcome all of you to the 24th annual lecture to be delivered by Dr SK Shashikumar senior fellow VV Giri National Labor Institute Noida on the topic towards ensuring a brighter future of work Let's begin the program by invoking the blessings of Almighty. I request Ms. Ashwathi S. of Third Year B.I. Economics to lead the prayer song. Akila chara chara rikshaga deva Agamalinyangale palike deva ಅಳಲಾಗೆ ನೀಕಿ ಆನಂತ ಮೀಗಿ ಸಕಲ ಸೌಭಾಗ್ಯಗಳಿಗೆ ನನ್ನಾದ ಕೃಷ್ಣನಂ ಕ್ರಿಸ್ತು ಅಲ್ಲಾಯುಮೀ ನಿಸ್ತುಲ ಸ್ನೇಹ ನೀಲಯ ಸೃಷ್ಟಿಯಂ ರಕ್ಷೆಯು ಸಂಹಾರಮೇವ ಸಕಲ ಸೌಭಾಗ್ಯಂಗೇಣನಾದ ಸಕಲ ಸೌಭಾಗ್ಯ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಅಶ್ವತಿ ನಾವು ಐ ವುಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಅರವಿಂದ್ ಶಂಕರ್ ಎನ್ ಅಸಿಸ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಕನಾಮಿಕ್ಸ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಟು ಫಾರ್ಮಲಿ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ದ ಗೆಸ್ಟ್ ಓವರ್ ಟು ಯು ಸರ್ good morning to all respected principal of the college dr vargis matthew beloved head of the department sir vijay matthew honorable chief guest of the day dr s k shesh kumar former principals and former teachers of the department and other departments delegates from various institutions teachers research scholars and students from various departments all are welcome to the 24th annual lecture organized by the department of economics marthama college thiruvanna we are gathered here online for the 24th edition of the prestigious event of the department of economics it is a matter of pride that for almost a quarter century the department has been successful in conducting the program without a break even during the difficult times the fundamental aim of this annual lecture is the academic enrichment of the student community the organizers of this annual event have always been careful in choosing relevant social and economic issues as the theme of the lecture today the 24th annual lecture based on the theme towards ensuring a brighter future of work is convened in the backdrop of the ongoing transitions in the dynamic labor market 
from time to time the prestige of this annual event has been boosted up by the presence of eminent personalities like former finance ministers members of government bodies like planning board expenditure review committee extra academicians from national and international institutes and even members from international organizations like the world bank i am glad to say that today the 24th annual lecture will be delivered by dr s k shashikuma senior fellow bb green national labor institute noida dr s k shashikuma is one of the most renowned experts in the domain of labor research and training he has been a faculty member at bb green national labor institute for 30 years his focus areas include labor migration future of work labor market analysis and research methods dr shashi kumar has been a member of prestigious national commissions like the second national commission on labor committee on immigration act standing committee on labor force statistics ministry of statistics and program implementation etc he is also the coordinator of the brics network of labor research institutes he has represented india in the recent g20 and brics meetings and several conferences of international labor organization as a technical expert dr shashi kumar has undertaken nearly 60 research projects on key labor concerns and has been the course director of nearly 30 international and 160 national level training programs and workshops he has been a guest faculty at more than 50 major international and national level institutions and universities he has published nearly 70 major research publications and is the editor of the peer reviewed academic journal labor and development it is a great fortune of the department that amidst his busy schedule dr sk shashikumar has accepted our the lecture in the name of the college and the department I wholeheartedly welcome Dr. S K Shashikuma to the 24th annual lecture. Sir, you are most welcome. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our respected principal, Dr. Vargis Matthew, who has extended his valuable support and encouragement to this program. Sir, you are also welcome. Today, the moderator of the session is Dr. I C K John, former principal of the college and former head of the department. we are indeed fortunate that an ever enthusiastic academician like ic sir has once again become a part of this academic endeavor in the name of the college and the department i welcome dr ic k john to this program sir you are welcome next i wish to welcome the special invited guests of dr sk shashikumar to this annual lecture in the name of the college and the department with great ple- pleasure I also welcome the former principals and former teachers of the department and other departments to this program. Next I welcome all the delegates from various colleges and institutions including teachers, research scholars and students. I also extend a warm welcome to the teachers and students of other departments of this college. I also would like to welcome to this program our beloved head of the department professor Reggie Matthew who leads our team towards academic excellence. I also take this opportunity to welcome Professor Anu Kochi George, who efficiently coordinates this program with his global exposure in academic field as well as technical expertise. I also welcome Dr. Binu Govin, Professor Smeera Elsa Saji, and Professor Georgi Matthew to this program. Last but not the least, I welcome all the students of the Department of Economics to the 24th annual lecture by Economics Department. With this, I conclude my words. Thank you, one and all. thank you arvind sir professor raji mathi head of the department of our economics department is the real leadership behind this auspicious event i cordially invite him for the presidential address over to you sir respected chief guest of the day dr s k shashima sir senior fellow pdgiri national labor institute noida first college dr varish mathi sir 
moderator of the session, Respected Dr. Isaac Jones R. Respected former principals and former teachers of the department, teachers from neighboring colleges and of the college, beloved students of the department and from other departments and institutions, other special invites and well wishes, dear colleagues in the department, a very good morning to all. The Department of Economics of Marthama College started its journey in 1955, immediately after the humble beginning of the college in 1952. The department was upgraded to a postgraduate department in 1981 and to a research department in 1998. The Department of Economics has the unique achievement of conducting its annual lecture. For the last 23 years without any break. And this is the 24th annual lecture conducted by the department. And eminent scholars from within and outside the country were the chief resource persons. Thank God for making things possible. And thank all my respected former teachers in the department for your precious contributions to the department. Thank you. Respected Principal Dr. Varis Matsar for the great support extended to the department. May I take this opportunity to extend once more a warm welcome to our chief guest and resource person, Dr. S.K. Sashivumar Sar. Sir is one of the, renowned, the most renowned experts in the field of labor and uh, training. He has made very significant contributions to academic and policy matters relating to labor studies. He has been the faculty member at the Bibigiri National Labor Institute, which is a premier institute engaged in research and training on labor. Dr. Sashumar Sar has been a member of several prestigious national committees, including Second National Commission on Labor, Committee on Immigration Act, Government of India, Committee to Review Legislation on Labor Migration, Government of India, Expert Groups on Labor Bureau Surveys, Ministry of Labor and Employment. He has represented India in recent G20 and BRICS, which is the association of five major emerging nations, including India, meetings, and several ILO conferences. He has undertaken nearly 60 research projects and uh, nearly 70 research publications. He has been a guest faculty at more than 50 major international and national level institutions. And above all, he's a very good person, a great scholar and an academician. On behalf of the NDR department, I extend a very warm welcome to Dr. S.K. Sashimar Sar. Thank you, Dr. Sashimar Sar, for accepting our humble invitation to deliver this year's lecture. And the topic of this year's lecture is a very relevant topic towards ensuring a brighter field of work. Labor market is perhaps the most vulnerable segment of an economy. A lot of changes have been taking place in this segment. There has been unprecedented transformation in the world of work. More and more people are becoming unemployed. Technological achievements, automation, artificial intelligence, etc. may create new job opportunities. But that, and at the same time, several others may become unemployed. Sustainable practices like clean technologies will create 
millions of new job opportunities but on the other hand some millions will lose their livelihood now all we are living in a very difficult and challenging world particularly in the context of covid-19 pandemic the covid-19 pandemic has substantial impact on all aspects of our, of our living and on the labor market it has led to sharp fall in the demand for labor many lost their livelihood for many huge increase in their working burden as in the case of health workers the labor market disruptions affects almost all individuals and all countries but there are certain risk groups that includes migrant workers and workers in the informal sector digitalization has led to major shifts in the labor market ict became the backbone of world economies it has transformed jobs business and our societies it enabled remote work or work from home and distance learning in this context i think that we are going to discuss a very relevant topic like towards a brighter future of work and i am not going to take much of your time and want to conclude and hope that today's session will be much useful for all of us once again a warm welcome to dr sk shishumar sir and all the participants and uh, ex- express my sincere gratitude to all the respected participants guests teachers students and my colleagues in the department particularly a special thanks to professor anup kosh george who how taken a major role in fulfilling this event thank you all thank you very much thank you rajesh we are really grateful to the constant support and inspiration given to us to all our activities by our respected principal yogis matthew sir thank you for your gracious presence indeed i am very glad to invite him for his remarks to this session welcome sir good morning today's chief guest dr s k sachukumar senior professor v v giri national labor institute noida former principal dr ice ice ke jot sir sir the department professor reji matthew convenience of the program professor anup koshi george professor arvind shankar former teachers of the department uh, teachers from other colleges and my dear students greetings from mathura mathura college tiruvalla i congratulate the hod and the convenience for organizing this 24th annual lecture series we have with us today's guest of honor dr sk sachinkumar senior professor vv giri national labor institute noida sachinkumar is an expert in the field of labor studies and has been a member of different national commissions he is an authority to say on ideal work environment and its different dimensions we are very happy that dr sachinkumar sir is with us on behalf of mathan college fraternity i sincerely welcome you sir to the virtual platform of this lecture series <laughs> department of economics is one of the best departments in this college the department of race undergraduate postgraduate doctoral programs and uh, certificate programs it is an active research department and produced several phds every year the department conducts annual lecture on relevant topics the college maintains a year in the fourth cycle of nat accreditation and placed 84th position in all india new ranking 2020 also the college is an iso 9000 certified institution i am very happy that former principal of the college dr icke john sir is with us 
I welcome you, sir, to this annual lecture series. The world is going through a tough time. The pandemic COVID-19 has affected all sectors of the world. Daily, we used to say the word COVID-19 more than that of the word God. The impact of COVID-19 and its restrictions has been broad, which includes affecting general society, economy, culture, ecology, politics, and other areas. After the outbreak of this pandemic, a new type of culture was created. We have been forced to switch over to online platforms and the use of internet and information technology for communication and other routine works. With the spread of the pandemic, almost all regions have implemented lockdowns, shutting down activities that require human gathering and interactions, including colleges, schools, malls, temples, offices, airports, and railway stations. The lockdown has resulted in most people taking to the internet and internet-based services to communicate, interact, and continue with their job responsibilities from home. Internet services have seen rises in usage from 40% to 100% compared to pre-lockdown levels. Video conferencing services like Zoom have seen a 10 times increase in usage. Content delivery services have seen a 30% increase in content usage. Cities like Bangalore have seen a 100% increase in internet traffic. The employees are adjusting to new normals with meetings going completely online, office work shifting to the home with the new emerging patterns of work. These changes have come across most organizations, whether in business, society, or government. The changes have also come suddenly with barely any time for organizations and the people to plan for prepare and implement the new setups and arrangements. They have had to adjust, try, experiment, and find ways that did not exist before. Social distancing and its protocols developed a new work culture, work from home, surely WFH. Also for education institutions, the new way of communication, online teaching or online classes. These two ways are now very familiar and some of the employees prefer to WFH culture. Also, some students like online class culture. But we have to measure its effectiveness through some means. So, in this pandemic times, the theme towards ensuring a brighter future of work is apt and relevant. For a brighter future, the 10 recommendations of international labor organizations are well known and they are one protects fundamental workers' rights, an adequate living wage, limits on hours of work, and safe and healthy workplaces, social protection from birth to old age, lifelong learning that enables people to skill, reskill, and upskill, upgradation of technology change to boost decent work, investments in the care, green, and rural economies, ensure gender equality. Reshaping business incentives to encourage long term investments. Effective measures and mechanisms may be evolved to incorporate the two new words WFH and online culture for ensuring a brighter future work. Let me say one thing to students. For a brighter future, one must need good education. Education makes a door to bright future. A brighter future starts with an education. Education is self-empowerment. Receiving a good education helps empower you, thus making you strong enough to look after yourself in any given situation. Education helps you understand yourself better. It helps you realize your potential and qualities as a human being. It, it helps you to tap into latent talent so that you may be able to sharpen your skills. Let this annual lecture, its deliberations may help all of you to sharpen your knowledge and skills. Let me conclude. I wish all success to this annual lecture. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your remarks. Now let's enjoy a song by our second year BA comic friend, Ms. Jenna John. 
over to you, Jana. Hello, Kekamo. Hello. Carol, come, girl. Needs no introduction in this campus. He is a former principal of the college and is an eminent professor of our economics department. 
is continuing as a research guide in Mahatma Gandhi University. Thank you, sir, for your warm presence. We invite Dr. ICK John to kindly moderate this session. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Respected principal, chief guest, the distinguished scholar and professor, Dr. Sashumar, former principal, Dr. Ebron George, other dignitaries, teachers, and students. It's a matter of pleasure to note that the Department of Economics is organizing the annual lecture of the year today. It is the 24th lecture. The lecture was initiated when Dr. Abraham George was the head of the department. It is his vision which is behind this academic endeavor. My appreciation to our principal, Dr. Rajesh Matthew, head of the department, Professor Raji Matthew, convenience of this program, Professor Anup Koshi George, Professor Arvind Sangar, and other faculty members for their initiative. Without a break, we could organize the annual lecture for the past 24 years. And we are looking forward to the Silver Jubilee of our annual lecture. The topic of today's lecture is towards ensuring a brighter future of work. And it is delivered by an eminent scholar, Dr. S. K. Shashiuma. We were together in the University of Kerala during the later half of 1980s. We are the students of eminent teachers like Dr. P. R. Govindanathan Nair, Dr. Ramayandran Nair, Dr. S. Uma Devi, Dr. Radhakshman, Dr. Kunyaman, and Dr. G. Karnagaran Pillai. I still fondly remember the dynamism and enterprising nature of Dr. Sashiuma. In those days, he was very handsome. I assume still he is very handsome, very enterprise, and he is known for his gentle manners. Now coming over to our topic, it is pertinent to note that work, which is the articulation of labor, has a key role in all forms of economic activities. No production is possible without the intervention of work or labor. Right from the classical theories, we underline the importance of work in economic activities. As students of economics, we are very familiar with subsistence wage presented by Adam Smith, biological wage introduced by David Ricardo, then the Reserve Army of Unemployed, presented by Karl Marx. The labor market has undergone tremendous changes over the last many years. It is in this context that International Labor Organization initiated several studies on the changing fabric of labor market and work. New forces are transforming the nature of work. We are living in a world where technological advancement is the order of the day. We have machines, we have artificial intelligence, we have automation, we have robotics. All these are very important in the growth process. But note that the introduction of this mechanization will displace the labor. Labor may be the casualty of rapid mechanization. Therefore, we are living in a world where the work has to be reshaped. 
the workers have to be re-equipped and the labor market has to be restructured. Today's lecture will be an insight to these issues and Dr. Sashivumar is an apt person to present a roadmap for having a brighter future of work. Without work, wealth cannot exist. So we want to have a brighter future of work. With these introductory observations, may I request our scholar, Dr. S.K. Sashivumar, to deliver this year's annual lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Isaac, Isaac, sir. Now it's the time to invite our chief guest and keynote speaker of this 24th edition of this all number of students who have passed out of the department are positioned way well. This is the, and one more thing that I also know some of the present faculty and I can tell the students with certainty you're very lucky to have a very committed and a very competent faculty. Enjoy it. This is the 24th lecture, as has been indicated earlier. And if I look at the 23 people who have delivered these lectures, I feel truly humbled. Some of the outstanding public policy analysts, some of the fantastic teachers, great practitioners have delivered this lecture. At a personal level, as Isis was saying, and as a student of Karivatam for my PhD in the mid 80s to late 80s, our own teacher, Ramachandran sir, he used to teach MA economics, macroeconomics classes, and attending those classes really provided such an insight to this whole aspect of how you should study economics. And again, Several others, women, sir, Thomas Isaac, sir, Mary Mann, C.P. Chandrasekhar, these are all people, and I'm missing some names, but these are all people who have been great teachers, who have been great teachers. I personally have benefited from all of them. So that way, this lecture of mine is a tribute to all those teachers who shape our future. And we should always be indebted to them. At a personal level, I see knows it very well. I became what I am completely because of Professor Radhakrishnan and other teachers of the Department of Economics. Radhakrishnan sir is not with me right now. I know he must be listening to somewhere in heaven. So there's also a time to remember their contribution to us. As the principal was saying, education. Teachers play a very central role. We have been talking about this lecture, Anoop and myself and other faculty members for some time. Last year, it was all done, but I couldn't make it because of my professional commitments. Uh, I definitely am so happy that I could join you, Anoop, and others this year, although I would have loved to be with all of you physically. The Thiruvala as a place is something very close to my heart. Very close to my heart. You might be wondering, what is this guy has got to connect with Tiruvalla? The connect is, I have a very close friend of mine who studied with me in a boarding school. You can imagine, from when we were nine years old, we started our boarding life, Sainik school. Nine to 17 years, I was in Sainik school, along with this man. Sajike Thomas, his name is. He is now a fantastic professional, pharmaceutical professional in United States. Saji, if you're listening from New York, I know it's a little late. Big hello to you. I am in your domain with your brothers and sisters. And this man has been bombarding us from 1971. And even day before yesterday, when I spoke to him, all his conversation starts with something on Tiruvanna. So I know Tiruvanna more than many of you in many ways. But I definitely hope that I will be with you at some point of time. Before I start the lecture, there are two central aspects that I would like to highlight for the students to consider. The first is, so if you look at your curriculum, what you study in economics, 
both for graduation and post graduation they are essentially disciplinarian centers you study a lot of papers around economics micro macro public finance international economics and so on and so forth now if you look at the development in public policy you see a very distinct change what is the change many of the public policies are becoming interdisciplinary while you study disciplinary the way that you are expected to work is quite interdisciplinary so such kinds of lectures such kinds of interaction you should always try to nurture your interdisciplinary thinking process very important and if you want a subjective analysis for that nothing like labor that we will be discussing today we know labor is a factor of production i'm talking from an economic perspective we know that labor as a factor of production gets factor income in the form of wages so we can study about the wage determination models we know wage is a cost so you can study about the cost theories we know cost determines the price so you can go and make sophisticated econometric modeling and so on and so forth take it that side now flip the side a bit we are in a country where there are a large number of people who are socially from belonging to socially disadvantaged groups so we would definitely like to know where they are positioned in the labor market then it becomes a social analysis it becomes a social analysis likewise if you are thinking in terms of people moving from one region to another migration which has become very central today it becomes culture and space it's a very different dynamics that you have to engage with it many of the contemporary theories of migration are no more economics dominated they are very interdisciplinary behavior we know behavioral economics per se there have been nobel laureates around it we know richard taylor won the nobel prize for behavioral economics lots of work is centered around the behavior and let me give you an example this one example that i can never forget in my life a couple of decades back we were doing a training for a public sector big public sector undertaking and we had a very dynamic manager there one of the best managers whom i have ever met in my life the director of hr of that company that shashi you know our leadership is all retiring so we want to develop young leadership very noble thought so i decided to convene a program and i went to the public sector undertaking first day i met a lot of managers young uh, low level managers they were all i was asking them and they were all giving me this response shashi sir you know this trade unions are very tough very tough so i don't know whether how far you will be able to engage them in the learning process i was a little skeptical of listening to that just before the training i met our director hr the first thing is that shashi so grateful that you accepted our invitation to come over and i can tell you my trade union boys see the word that he used my trade union boys are brilliant they will make the learning process amazing and after that i felt quite relieved obviously then i said sir can i go and see the uh, shop floor then he said fine why not so he i came to need me to the shop floor and we walk around the factory and what i saw my friends for the next 30 minutes was unbelievable every worker there the moment you see the manager they will start smiling he will communicate with some of them talk something about their family you know it was enjoyment to the core and i came back and i said sir you are a magician you have you have woven a war wound over it everybody is so happy then he said nothing shashi it's all behaving respecting workers i realized all my management models doesn't work that way it's all behavior so that is why i always say such examples such cases also teach us the need to develop interdisciplinary perspective 
I would even recommend in my research methods courses, I recommend people to read beyond disciplines. I know it should not curtail to your uh, exam preparations, but you should not get stuck with that disciplinarian approach because as you will see later, there's a lots of interdisciplinary approaches coming in in the future of work. That's the first point. The second is a you should always make evidence-based arguments. Social policy, especially issues like labor, you can make a lot of arguments which are perception-based. You just go out, talk to someone and ask, is labor law good? Oh, it's very bad. Why? It's bad. Do you have some evidence? I don't have any evidence, but I know it. This perception-based argument is very dangerous in social policy analysis. If you want to be a good social policy analyst, you should always make evidence-based argument. And I borrow the word of one of the greatest statisticians from whom I've learned a lot, Professor S.P. Mukherjee. He always says, there's nothing like a perfect evidence, but there is always credible evidence. Credible. Whether you use a secondary source of information or a primary source of information, secondary means pre-existing and primary means as a researcher, there's also a research department, you go out and generate resources. I mean, sorry, information. When you do that, you should always try to generate credible information. And as a researcher, when you generate credible information, what it matters is your understanding about research methods. I strongly recommend, very strongly recommend all of you to read basic research methods textbook. Don't hesitate to buy. Keep it on the table. If you're using questionnaire, you should know, why am I using questionnaire? Why am I using questionnaire? You should know that. If I'm using focus group discussion, why I should know why? Basic research methods textbooks is mandatory reading for everyone. In fact, I suggest that even for BA students, you should do that. It, it sharpens your thinking process. So these two words, these of caution, transdisciplinary perspective and evidences should be at the back of your mind always. Then you become a better professional. A better professional. And last but not the least, before I start my PowerPoint, always during the course of the introductory remarks, presidential remarks, we heard this lifelong. You know, learning is lifelong. If I think that I am one who knows everything on labor, I'm going to tell you and you listen to all that and learn. I'm sorry, that's not the way that learning happens. Learning is a process. There are many things that you're going to ask me which makes me think at the end of the uh, lecture. Learning, after all, is a dynamic entity. And you know, the best way to learn is learn with pleasure, never with pressure. Khushi say, if I have to use a Hindi word, as I am in North, North of India, you always say Hindi is a romantic language also. Khushi say, happy, don't take pressure on your head to learn. Learning methods itself is undergoing lots of changes. If you look at some of the best universities, learning methods itself is changing. So let's enjoy with pleasure some things that I might give as ideas on future of work. Okay. I'm sharing uh, my screen, Anup. Yes, sir. I hope you can see it, Anup. No, sir. Uh, yeah, it's you can yeah. see it? Just a minute, sir. Can you see the uh, screen? Yeah. yeah, sir, it's visible. Okay. Now, future of work. What made future of work a very important theme? Future of work became a very important theme somewhere close to 2019. 2019 was a very significant year. Because that was the centenary celebrations of the first international organization in the world, ILO. So ILO was planning for its centenary celebration and they chose future of work as the theme. Particularly because the kind of transformations that were happening a couple of decades prior to that 2019 decade were phenomenal. Not only phenomenal, something that the world had not anticipated. 
So naturally, that posed a central question. If these transformations have happened, how will the future of work pan out? How will the future of work pan out? To understand that, they said we should understand the mega drivers of transformations in the world of work. What are the mega drivers? Demographic alterations, I mean, sorry, transitions is one of the major changes that's happening. How do you study that? You study that by looking at what is known as the one simple indicator is dependency ratio. Dependency ratio. You will see a lot of BRICS comparison. That's basically because the BRICS 2021 is coming and I'm preparing some issue notes around it. And if you look at the concept of dependency ratio, it's defined as those who are above 65 and below 15 are the dependent population. Who are they dependent on? 15 to 64. So naturally, if you're a young country like India, India is one of the youngest countries in the world. If you take the latest population estimates of the United Nations, one in five in the age group 15 to 29 is an Indian. One in five. So it's a big number. So you can always be proud. We keep on hearing young India, demographic dividend. So naturally, that, if you look at the pyramid of the population, that bulges up the say, younger age cohorts. So naturally, with the fertility rates declining, that is less than 15 declining, and not much of 65 plus, not much of 65 plus, your dependency ratio will start falling. It started falling somewhere around 1980. It fell continuously sharply initially. Now it's a little flattening around 2030. But of course, the young population's growth is also declining. So it adds to the labor market. So what are the challenges with respect to labor market? The major challenge is so there is increasing number of young people coming into the labor market. That's the main challenge, particularly in countries like India and other emerging economies. And you should also know that these are young people who have better educational attainment. So they have naturally wider labor market aspirations. Wider labor market aspirations. Each one of you who is a BA student or an MA student when you come out, you have certain aspirations. So naturally, the world of work has to respond to it. That's one side of the transformation in terms of demography. The second transformation is what is happening in many other countries. The 65 plus is growing. Fertility rate is declining. The whole of Europe, the population growth will be negative and cannot be sustained. There is no in-migration. So Germany is the classic example. A large percentage of population are above 65. So it pulls up the dependency ratio. So you'll see the cur curve going up. Countries like China started moving up. Do you understand the point? So that's how you study demographics. You study demographics. In the context of India, again, I'm happy that this point was said in the beginning. Though we are young, it is also equally important to understand that a substantial number of people in India are becoming old. As per the estimates, 2021 census is, will be results will be out early next year. As per the estimates, around 10% of India's population, 10% is a big number. 10% of 130 crores. So it's a big number are old people, about 60. If you consider about 60 as more of old, relatively. And if you look at the latest statistics, the life expectancy at 60 itself, there's a concept called general life expectancy and another concept called life expectancy at 60. Life expectancy at 60 is around 14. So you only leave 14 years. Old age is one. Very important dimension of public policy that we should be considering in future. If you look at some of the best countries where practices are there, I always take examples like Sudan. It's a small country, but you know why I take an example of Sudan? Many people have this misconception, oh, that um, uh, in market economies, there's no trade union. Very wrong. Sudan has the highest trade union density in the world. That means of the total workers, how many are part of the trade unions? 
So naturally, it's about 60%. So when you have high trade union density, bargaining takes place. I know some Swedish trade union leaders and keep on informing me what they're bargaining. You know what they bargain now? They don't bargain about wage. They bargain about old age security. That's why it's very important for India to also consider more institutionalized systems in policies relating to old age. Otherwise, we right now consider old age in a very casual manner. Very casual manner, individual. That's not the way. The kind of old age pensions that ex exist, I'm not citing the figures, it's too low for an old age family to survive. We need a serious look at that also. So young doesn't mean that you miss the old. Young does not mean that at all. That's why sometimes you say life, even international labor organization and all say, please don't analyze, analyze work only in terms of work life. Analyze work in terms of lifelong approaches. Lifelong. That should become very central. Even saving habits. When people retire, I am engaged. Sometimes I do financial counseling. Many of the workers at the lower end know how to spend money. In the retirement function, even in your college, it's the most uh, interesting function. You start hearing people telling anything and everything about the worker who is retiring, except what the worker thinks he is or she is. That's not the way that we should be responding to retirements. We should be responding to old age by preparing them to respond. That is very important. Again, many countries, even in India, many enterprises, I know, Many enterprises are engaged in such kinds of practices. That makes a worker much more comfortable in old age. The next factor that is about technology. Again, mentions have been made about technology. We are a generation which are experiencing technological transformation. One of the best books that I ask all the students to read is Klaus Schaub's book, Fourth Industrial Revolution. It's a simple book. Read it. You get an understanding about how from Fourth Industrial Revolution, that is First Industrial Revolution, 1760-1840 period, we move to the Fourth Industrial Revolution. What is the difference? The difference are two essential. One, the speed at which technology is changing. At that point of time, it took a lot of time for something to reach. Now, it is swift. The second is, till the third industrial revolution, we never considered machine to be intelligent. So artificial intelligence is coming in. So that way, technology's speed and the nature is changing. I will come back to the technology aspect of how it is affecting work through evidence. Globalization, that's the third factor. We still in the space. Between 1980 and 2000, what does globalization entail? Economic openness. That's all. If you want to see it is economic openness. How do you open up or how do you made to open up? Disband tariffs, trade. One of the core aspects of global. Even stiglets. Nobel Prize. He was in with I am criticizing globalization. So one is trade liberalization. The second is financial liberalization. Dismantle barriers for financial flows. Financial and move as much as possible. The third is what? Foreign direct investment. Dismantled. We are experiencing in all this from 1991. So the argument was by restricting, you were putting caps on growth. You were deterring growth. By liberalizing, scale up higher growth. It's true. It's true. If you look at the growth, just two years, look at it in this graph, only two years, 2006-07, see the figure. 
a very high growth, 5.5 percent. Also, seriously, deep growth. low growth prices know that look at the growths look at the growths but then within no time the economy is bounced back bounced back recording growth similar to the pre crisis level so People who were supporting globalization said, see, we told you market works on its own. But actually, that was not the reason. If you decompose this growth, if you decompose this growth, we have done some work. Analysts are very cheap on this. If you decompose this economy, so many people have this is a well-known fact. How, how is growth generated? Growth is generated from consumption growth. We know that. From investment growth, from government expenditure, and from export minus import net trade. So in a typical uh, economics form, I can sophisticate economics by saying equation. Y is equal to C plus I plus G plus X minus M. Uh, you add some log and uh, Anup will add some more uh, additional uh, variables and make it very sophisticated. The logic is growth happens because of this. What did contribute to the growth in 2010? It was all government expenditure. It was all government expenditure. Why? Because the governments knew from the Keynesian uh, birth after Great Depression that government expenditure is something that pulls the economy up when the economy is in dire streets. But then the problem with government expenditure is it cannot be sustained. Revenue cannot match expenditure. So naturally deficit becomes, prices will rise. So naturally so the expenditure starts coming down and the growth slow down. One thing that you must know, not it reached COVID. Many people attribute several things to COVID. But it's very important to understand the structural position before COVID. Economy-wise, labor-wise, own account workers, those who work on their own, they don't employ anyone, rickshaw pullers, hawkers, vendors, name, anything. Employer, those who employ others, I'm an employer, I start a college, employ you. Very Nineteen figures, periodic labor force survey. Again, I'm glad that I was one of the guys who started this periodic labor force survey in India 2017-18. There also it was Professor S. P. Mukherjee who headed our committee. That's why I said I've learned a lot of things from him. So if you look at 36.5 plus 13.3 plus 24.2, you understand the vulnerability of Indian labor market. It's a very vulnerable labor market. So you need to address it. Self-employed people. If you want to transform them, casual workers, push them to regular. What are the characteristics? Then only the future of work can be beneficial for many. Another problem, which is a very serious problem. Again, many people have a misconception about this. Very low percentage of people in India have formal skill training. You see the figure, total, for 15 to 29 and 15 to 59. And total, it's around about 5.2%. Total. That's all. That is all. We have a long way to go in skill. And even those who are under skill training, they also need a lot of scaling up. Industrial training institutes gives you a formal skill. I have done studies on industrial training institutes. A very problematic institution. Such a fascinating concept. Started in uh, uh, backward areas. Attended by low income and socially disadvantaged groups. But those who come out of there, who know their trade, don't get jobs. You know why? They don't have communication skills. They don't have interpersonal skills. It's not their fault. The curriculum is highly trade-centric. Highly trade-centric. So that the companies won't hire them. You ask any employer, he will say that, Shashi, I'm not getting people with skills. Sir, they are also not employable. The concept of employability comes. So we have to go from the concept of employment to employability, skill, even there is an example. 
India is a country with high unemployment rates. Huh? No doubt about it. Mark, say, you look at 15 to 29, 17.4 percent, and within 20 to 24, which is a disturbing thing. This is not good because several studies, especially the ILO, have that such kinds of unemployment can lead to. Survey, I asked the person, How old is 23 years? Oh, you are, four, four. you are a young person. Then I asked you some questions. Okay, I asked you, Are you in education? Anup says, No. Oh, are you in employment, either working or looking for work? No. Oh, are you in training? No. Then where are you? Where are you? Neither in employment, nor in education, nor in training. India has the highest need percentage among women. I can tell you the numbers. You can find out the reasons. It's a very good research area. I can tell you. We must know the reasons. We must know the reasons. Then only we can have the policies. India, again, is a serious issue with manufacturing. India has one of the lowest manufacturing employment in India. If you really want to scale up technology and use it, it has to go beyond 12.2%. Even in states like Gujarat or other states which have high rates of manufacturing, the employment is the dominant. We should change it. We have not been getting investments. Investments. Then you will think, well, I have two reasons. One is most of the enterprises, this is a uh, slide that I'm borrowing from the economic survey 2018-19, most of the enterprises in India are small. Nothing wrong with micro, but make micro small, small, medium, medium, large. This is called enterprise growth. Only when there is an enterprise growth, their contribution to employment and to the value added increases. Right now, their contribution is only in terms of number of employees. So politically, sometimes micro, small, I'm not making any political arguments against anyone. But it's a fact. Politically, sometimes the numbers might be very important. Oh, I gave so many micro loans. Fantastic. But how much is the value of the micro loans? Yeah, 50,000. Will it generate additional employment? No. Is he already employed? Yes. Gone. So what is additional employment? That's what I'm looking at. Or you are looking at. That is why we say we need, if you look at the history of industrialization, there was always a gradation of firms. Gradation of firms. Rana Hassan of the Asian Development Bank has done some fantastic work on it. Another work that I have done, I'm proud to say that I was an author with one of the best economists whom I think, and you, in a way, he's my student also, we know Jebraham. So we did a paper. It's a little dated, but trends have not changed. This is how you divide value added, isn't it? Value added is divided in terms of factor incomes called wages, rent, interest, and profits. Self-explanatory. Look at the growth of wages and profits. Blue and light, lightish blue. After 90, this is the problem. To us, we argue. We strongly argued in the Sayadaw paper, this is happening because we are resorting to low root of employment. The profits are bulging. Even Bill Gates argues that we should not allow the profits to bulge beyond a point because then there will not be any demand for my products. That's why he suggested even robot tax. That's something that we should be considering. Yes, we study in economics. Profits is needed for reinvestment. At what level? That's why I said distributional gains in productivity increase should be more deeply studied in India. If you want to gain, I feel one of the reasons, this is our argument, one of the reasons for suppressed investment in India is suppressed effective demand. Every country labor income shares are declining. That is why Biden was very clear. That is why uh, uh, Angela Merkel in uh, Germany was very clear. We are going to increase wages. Because when wages increase, those economies, 50%, 60%, 70%, no, 80% are wage employees. They will get a scale up, effective demand. Then will come the investment. That is the way that we look at it. Some pathways. 
I will quickly wind up in two minutes, not three minutes. Employment-centered macroeconomic policy. It's very essential in a country like India. You saw some of the challenges. The first point to me is expansionary fiscal policy. I would even suggest, in fact, in a very recent meeting, prior to the budget, we had suggested this. Go for even required deficit finance. It doesn't matter. Pull up the demand. Because with long time, employment elasticity is declining. And you have studied in economics, employment elasticity means when one more unit of employment uh, output is produced, how much employment? That's called employment elasticity. So when output is increasing, when productivity is increasing, naturally employment elasticity will fall because it's an inverse relation. Any increase in productivity, if you want, you will have to sacrifice employment elasticity. So how much will you sacrifice? This is the question. So you need higher productivity and higher growth so that expansion of fiscal policies becomes very central. For me, 1980s and 1990s, we had a lot of discussion around rural non-farm employment. To me, that is very central even today. I'm not talking about agriculture. I'm talking beyond agriculture. Non-farm employment, particularly in rural and semi-urban area, peri areas, is central for India to achieve more and more developments in the labor market. Definitely. Skills, I've already said, except that we should nudge. I'm a great fan of behavioral economics. You should nudge workers for skill acquisition. Emphasize on the job, on the job training. Promote skill bargaining. These are points that I've already said based on the arguments that quality apprenticeship, these are skills. Please, all of you, you should switch from this concept of, oh, I just need this skill to get a job. Stop it. You need skills to survive throughout your work life. Stop it. You need skills to li lifelong problem solving, learning skills, communication skills, social behavioral skills, teamwork, conflict resolution. If you don't have that, uh, uh, such skills, then conflicts never get resolved at workplaces. When technology and all get introduced, naturally there will be conflicts. That's what you should study and understand how these conflicts are getting resolved. You will realize it has a lot to do with the behavioral part. And we always think that technology means capital. Where is the worker? Learn from Japan. Make worker integral of innovation and technology plans. There are many instances in India also. I know even in public sector enterprises. Incentivize ideas. This is a typical uh, Japanese concept. I, I, I mean, I've visited some of the Japanese factories. In fact, I'm happy to say that some of the public sector where I trained, we have introduced it. If you, if you say Japan started this, you know, in the 1970s, 80s and all. If you suggest something to reduce your cost, say, imagine if I'm an individual worker, I get 10 rupees. And if it is implemented, it should be original. If it's implemented, I get 20 rupees. Okay? And the same stroke they said, so because in workstations, workers work in, in team. If you give, if you give a shabda, if you give a team suggestion, if you give a team suggestion, then each team member gets 20. Each team member gets 20. And if it is accepted, each team member gets 40. So in one stroke, Individual at workplace is gone. They introduced managers and workers working together in team. We should try things like that to make workers integral to technology plans. And this is, again, digital learning resources. I'm a great fan of digital learning resources. I've seen the benefit of it in many places. You cannot expect sometimes everything to be online. We, have all, we ourselves have done massive online open courses on youth unemployment throughout the world. I collaborated with the International Training Center of Turin. We did it. India had the largest participation. But it has to be more of digital resources. Basic AI tools. Vietnam. Sometimes we consider though Vietnam is progressing well. He said because of labor law, Shashi. No, sir. Nothing. It is basically because they give artificial intelligence as open sources. Because many small industries cannot afford such kinds of technology. Make technology accessible 
to, to small enterprises. Otherwise, there will be a technology or a digital divide. This is something that I said, National Career Service, there, these are uh, uh, issues there you can really work on. And I know that if I don't say anything about labor law reforms, you will think that why is he not talking anything about labor law reforms? We need labor law reforms, no doubt about it. We need to replace existing complex fragmented systems. Multiplicity is in plenty. The same definition wage defined in different labor laws differently. Align labor laws reforms to other market reforms. Encourage collaboration between partners. Use of technology. And as I said, we were a member. I was a member of the Second National Commission, which drafted this, uh, say, labor law recommendation. We have now four labor laws. I don't get into the details of it because it will take another presentation. But if there are some questions around it, I can answer. Public employment to me is very central in the context of future of work. Many people think that government does not have a role in employment. No, you go to the rural areas even today, that is the safety bank. There, are, there is strong consideration that we should have such an urban employment program also. Certain states, it may not be doing very well, but many other states, especially it has reduced distressed migration considerably. Migration, I've already indicated. So what to me, after all this, is essential. It's an integrated approach. You don't have a one-stick approach. Unidimensional won't have work. Integrated and multidimensional approach. As I said, don't focus exclusively on quantity. Anything that you do, there's a quantity quality balance. That's what is required, even in technology. Say, you might produce more and increase your productivity, but is it at the expense of very poor work quality? Then you should be debating. That is where I believe this very linked to processes, what you adopt, are as important as outcomes, even in research, isn't it? So you, your research outcomes depends upon the methods that you adopt, the methodology that you adopt. So they are the processes of your outcomes. If you write a good paper with a strong framework, you can say, oh, I adopted a good methodology. If you use very good data, credible data to generate outputs, you can say, wow, I used some strong methods. So that is why never compromise on the processes. Don't look at the outcomes. That's what is happening to all this labor force participation for women. We, we, we have already determined many processes in India are gender biased at workplace, at workplace. So the moment it is gender biased, gender as a construct does not come in as an outcome. So immediately you will have gender skewiness persisting. We do not want that. We want an inclusive, brighter, future of work for all. Thank you so much. I'll stop sharing. There is a list of references I've given or whatever I've cited. If you need, anyone needs anything more, please feel free to ask me anytime. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I took a couple of minutes extra, but uh, I, 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 mean, I wanted to finish what I had come prepared. Thank you. Thank you for your very outstanding and interesting lecture, sir. It was really a wonderful experience for students and also other participants. In the initial stage, your emphasis was on preferred skills for hiring workers. You have presented five skills, including positive attitude, adaptability, learning ability, domain expertise, and interpersonal skills. And at the end of the lecture, you have given some astonishing, very interesting facts to the audience. Three are very important. One, you have stated that Indian labor market is very vulnerable. Even before having the problem of COVID-19, we are experiencing these vulnerable situations. A second very interesting finding is that India is a nation having very low percentage of people with skill training. That means we have a nature of unemployment characterized by absence of skills, 
which are enough for any form of work a third very thing term presented by you is neat our people our youngsters many in rural areas they do not have education they do not have employment training and therefore we are in a particular situation a very tough situation called neat and your emphasis on macroeconomic policies which are required for having a future work prospects in india you argue for expansionary fiscal policy a focus on rural economy reorienting our skill system so that we want to have a new ecosystem is very important so we want to acquire new skills which remain the focus we want to have new skills so it is very interesting to learn from you that we need not fear about technology because technology will promote employment so we want to integrate technology with labor so we want to have a labor friendly technological approach which will provide a bright future for work then the focus on the use of digital tools is very important then we want to have public employment programs with respect to our dreams of future work three are very important one you have stated that we want a new approach called the integrated and multi dimensional which will provide more scope for employment we want to have a balance between quality and quantity and the most important processes are as important as outcomes in many situations our attention is only on outcome but in your view process is more important so we are very lucky to have a very wonderful lecture now it is open for a discussion it is over to audience if you have any questions if you have any doubts if you need any clarifications please you can take this time to ask questions you just unmute your mobile and raise questions we have some 15 minutes for discussion sir can you hear me i can hear you sir good afternoon thank you for your one a couple of doubts regarding the uh, labor market uh, one is that uh, since you have uh, you have been working in different commissions regarding the labor uh, field could you get any uh, information or findings regarding the mismatch between the qualifications of an a candidate and his employment like a person who is qualified uh, professionally like a btech or mtech and he is getting employed somewhere in a bank or insurance company which is not at all correlated with his original qualification so such kind of a trend is visible in states like kerala so uh, in, uh, in the labor point of view could you get any uh, conclusive uh, findings regarding that aspect that's my first question and the second one uh, actually i am standing in front of in, in front of my students who are uh, learning pure economics not the actuarial or application level economics so what is their scope in the labor market if uh, they are studying the pure subject instead of the analytical uh, ones which are taught in the foreign universities so uh, if they are not uh, going through the professional education do they have any scope in the uh, la- wider labor market or should they depend only upon the government organized sector as my second up thank you sir uh it's a uh, thank you arvind fantastic questions both uh, uh, very relevant in the context of uh, uh, employment first yes this ha- is happening and it is happening in big scale big time big time you know what we can do is there have been some analysis which has been done it's looking at the skill pyramid so we look at skill pyramids at two levels one is skill pyramid from a supply level okay what is happening to the skill pyramid how much now skilled how many medium skill how many professional what is the supply proposition 
another is demand. So one example that has happened is there are some very interesting studies on technical evaluations. I will send you that. Is in the last 25 years, a lot of emphasis has been on higher end skills on the skill pyramid for professional colleges. Engineering is one example, law, marketing, MBA, all this is happening on the skill pyramid. Now you take the skill pyramid to the skill demand, the demand side pyramid. So you follow, you can see two sides of pyramids. Okay. So these guys who are passing out of this skill supply should essentially match the upper end of the skill pyramid from a demand side. So if you are millions, we never talked about the political rights of the migrants. I'm happy that the Honorable Prime Minister went on record saying that we must accept the contribution of migrants. So it requires a lot of strength to characterize, to say that. It's a very good thing. The first thing that if you want migrants to be accepted is accept their contribution. Most people look at migrants in a negative tone. Even in Kerala, I know, my own friends who have worked on migration say, Shashi sir, crime is increasing. Are, bhai, this is a very weak argument. Your own state. And then another person, friend of mine who said, sir, resources are getting drained from Kerala. Are, how can you say that? Your economy is 33% dependent on your remittances in. Then you are saying that your resources are getting strained away. So there's a, you can't take the double talk. You have to take a strong argument in support of voice of migrants. We should do that. One. Second, absolutely no coherence between sending and receiving states. Nothing. Nothing. Migration entails space. If ICSR allows me, I can give you a fantastic example of a policy on migration, which is the most brilliant policy on public policy I have ever seen in the world. That is policy in South Korea. You know, South Korea now is facing aging. It's a fact. South Korea is facing aging. So they wanted people to come in. They had a very restrictive immigration policy. So they allowed. But when they allow, this is how they make policy. See, this is how public policies is made. They invited a large number of experts to deliberate on it, point number one. They generated evidence, point number two. They made a policy, point number three. The policy was very clear in terms of process and outcome, point number four. What was their outcome? They wanted migrants to come, work for some period and go back. So they don't want people to be reintegrated. Example from United States. Problem with the United States is people come, they don't go back or try to reintegrate, which the Korea said no. And you know, for that, say they have a fascinating policy. You go, Shashi Kumar is going from Noida, imagine. I'm squeezing that in two minutes, one minute. You go there, I'm going in, let's say, 2015. I'm supposed to come back by 2020 December, five year contract. Okay? So they want you to return. So they have named the policy. You know, what is the name of the policy? Happy return program. You understand the point? Incentive. The very fact that if Shashi Kumar is going, where are you going? Korea. What is that? Happy return program. Oh, that means you will return. Inject that. This is that behavior nudging. You understand the point? So the behavior is nudged in. Oh, I'm going. So after going there, what? I have to register. Online, I get benefits. See, online I get benefits. What are the benefits? And I, I get Korean language free. So every Saturday, Sunday, I get free Korean language classes. After three and a half to four years, I can write an exam on Korean language. I get a certificate. Imagine I get an A certificate. Then after four years, I can apply for my skills to be accredited. What all did I learn there? Any migrant, any go there. In Kerala, Gulf migrants come back with skills. But you ask the 33% remittances they have contributed, you ask Kerala government, say, hey, what is the level of skills that the migrants possess? No information. You understand the point? No information. It's a fact. No information. I know the information about money. I don't have the information about their skills. So that's not important. That's why I said finance overtakes human everywhere. And then this, after four and a half years, I get another certificate. The Shashi Kumar has done in automobile engineering. He has got this, 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 this skill. So I get two certificates. This much I could also take. I see, sir, 
After that, I couldn't think what, what I saw. I can off upload all my documents. Okay? This for only migrants who are going in. Upload the documents and suppose I have to upload six months prior to coming back. So if I'm coming back in 2020 December, 2050, 2020 June, I upload. I upload my CV, I upload my language certificate, I upload my skill certificate. And then they forward, the government forwards this to all the Korean companies in India, saying that here is a Shashi Kumar who worked in Korea for four and a half years, is expected to return by December 31st, possesses such a skill certificate, possesses such a uh, uh, language certificate. Within no time, I get recruitment offers from Indian Korean companies. Happy return program. No overstay. Public policy can be made. This is why Abhilash, even Kerala, I know people like, say, some of them, I work with Benoit Peter and all our people who are doing good work in the area of Kerala, but actually they have told me that, you know, in spite of the fact that we are a sending state, we have not dovetailed the learnings from sending to our receiving cultures. We always see it in two, 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 two polarized entities, basically because our sending policies even today are also not very strong. We don't have proper information. You tell me how, except Kerala Migration Survey, uh, but it's very, it has got its own issues. You know? We should have characteristics of skills, return skills. What kind of skills did they learn? How much are you a willful returnee or a forced returnee? How much money did you pay in re recruitment? I would like to know all this. Recruitment cost is very important because that cost actually pushes up your, say, um, uh, liabilities. So these are the information. And then housing, uh, Anu, uh, sorry, Abhilash, housing. I am in a committee in the government today. This is what the industry wants. They say that we, because they are having shortage of workers, they are not coming back. In north of India, this is a major problem. Those who have gone there are sticking there. It's a fear, insecurity. It's a fear. So. They want to come back, but first thing that they look for some is some hygiene, which they never looked for. Some sanitation, which they never looked for. Some kind of social protection, which they never looked for. So now suddenly there is some kind of demand. So industry is willing. You will soon see industries constructing or paying rented premises for migrants. It's a very good thing. I don't want crisis to do such things, but industry requires migrant workers. That's the plight in India. Also, local labor, this is a very, very famous book, Abhilash, you should read if you're interested on migration by, of Payore. 1979, Birds of Passage. In that particular work, Payore has very clearly argued that demand for migration should be studied not from the prism of supply, it should be studied from the prism of demand. There will always be demand for low-end skilled worker. Certain categories of work will become migrant-centric. He predicted in 1979. You take Indian cities, go and see where is the migrant worker working. I can close my eyes and say domestic. I can close my eyes and say low-end construction. So we need to be passionate to them. We cannot say that, oh, you are contributing, but your contribution should be remained invisible. How many states in India can say, what is the percentage of contribution of the migrants to the development of that state in quantitative terms? How many states can say? Even Kerala, you always say that 33% remittances are coming in. That is their contribution. What is the contribution of migrants within Kerala to the state domestic product of Kerala? That should be a concentration. Then you start recognizing the value of migrants. Don't, I'm sorry, migrants, I should stop here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You want something, Abhishek? I, you send me, I have a large amount of information on migration. Anyone? Okay, sir. If no more questions are there, we may conclude this session. Sir, I have a question. Okay, okay. Ask, you ask. 
sir you talk about this adaptability learning ability etc so how can a student can expertise without having field experience in their own areas during their studies you say that many companies uh, i mean employers say that they don't get skilled laborers so where is the real problem stands wonderful question sir salomon i am so happy that you raised the question actually this is where i said say all this must become curriculum of the colleges you understand the point i also said that curriculum needs restructuring anup asked about this national education policy some part of it anup gets addressed some part not in full i would say that curriculum fixation should even become more autonomous i think so more autonomous because you raised a very fundamental point learning agility I and mean, how do i develop learning agility for that you should be taught learning methods seriously you must be taught how do you read a book many of us you know what is the biggest problem of indian researchers writing i know why nobody is going to give you training i say that you should be taught to write this is my point what is wrong in it what is wrong in it learning methods should become an integral subject in fact salomo i can suggest you several ways you can yourself do it in your department radha krishnan sir used to i say sir you know he used to make us all his research scholars read every friday a book and explain what you have read in front of others you understand the point so that sharpen <laughs> your agility to understand what you are learning sometimes i read a book i forget what i have learned i did not i don't assimilate this man i used to be afraid of him i used to petrify seeing him ah next week you will read one book come and explain in front of our group we had some four five groups jacob john salim and things like that rama i remember all of them so naturally when you are explaining to your fellow scholars you want some kind of understand you understand the point then we used to discuss writing i think we should focus on such basic skills also it doesn't take much time sir to sharpen this i have learned in my life that if you keep on practicing how many researchers practice on writing we don't practice on writing we try to write we don't practice on writing methods to me is central so that is where learning how you improve learning outcomes behavior many times becomes very important learning writing reading all these are very very how say some people say that nowadays you know parents can contribute significantly you will ask how collaborative reading huh anup this is a new method in learning father and mother reads with the children when they are young things like newspapers collaborative reading the new method as a consequence of which within the family there's an learning ambience created it helps the child also and you can also so people use maps i know a friend of mine specializing in it. so he says that oh i have traveled from here to here so he tells his stories so it becomes very curious learning should be converted even pure science somebody asked a question about pure science pure science also needs to be converted within a practical environment then your learning becomes like you study uh, uh, trade unions unless and until that's why i said you should visit factories unless and until you know how trade unions relate with the management how do you know so i might have studied the best of theories of trade unions but i do not know any damn thing about the workplace practices that is why that field level practices must be built in so it's possible i am an optimist and i think that learning methods can improve many institutions are doing liberal last point is liberal point of view is you study economics you also take music as a subject you understand the point so that you enjoy that it allows i know a friend of mine's daughter who's a dider in of course it was from the university she did economics and she studied com, uh, along with the music that is a very interesting composition combination so th- she is enjoying that 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 kind of flexibility our curriculum right now that's where starting point we we were disciplinary 
that is the problem thank you sir so now it is time to wind up this academic discussion we are thankful to you for having a wonderful presentation on future prospects of labor how to make labor more brighter in our environment so we have the chance to meet a, a theoretician and a practitioner you are both a theoretician and a practitioner and we feel that uh, your legacy inherited from the university of kerala is still important so it is our request while formulating policies and programs please take note of all these matters so that we can have a brighter future of work in our nation so i conclude with one sentence with your policy conclusion we want to focus on a new policy derivative very small should become small very small become small then small become medium then medium become large and finally large become very large thank you for this wonderful presentation thank you sir now it is over to the organizers for the next proceedings thank you sir since the discussion has been over now i would like to invite professor anup koshi george assistant professor department of economics to propose the vote of thanks of over to you sir thank you respected principal dr vogis mathew sir distinguished guests for the day dr sk shashivamar sir moderator dr ick john sir president of this meeting and head of the department professor reji mathew and all distinguished guests a good afternoon all this is indeed a special day for the department of economics of mardava college tiruvalla the department has accomplished yet another milestone in its journey amidst the crisis of covid pandemic we are able to organize the 24th annual lecture in the lecture series which started in the year 1998 the topic for this year's lecture is today's ensuring a brighter future of work a theme which is based on the centenary initiatives of the international labor organization the 108 international labor conference in 2019 adopted future of work as the centenary declaration this year we are we are very much fortunate to have an eminent and suitable person to deliver the lecture of the of this topic of great contemporary relevance in this covid time more than being a scholar dr shashivamar sir has represented india in various conferences of the ilo and various other economic groupings of world nations like g20 and brics sir responded positively to our request and accepted the invitation and delivered a very valuable and meaningful lecture sir is currently the head of the subgroup on labor bureau all india survey of migrant workers which is to be launched in march 2021 in spite of the busy schedule sir found time to be with us we are very much grateful to you sir on the behalf of the department of economics and everyone participating in this event i express a sincere gratitude for delivering the 24th annual lecture of the department thank you such humor sir i take this time to thank the liberal principal dr vogis mathews sir for all his support guidance and words of encouragement i sincerely thank the moderator of the event dr ick john sir the former principal of the college for all his support and motivation and also thank all respected research guides of the department for their support The department is currently led by Professor Reji Mathew, a man of utmost dedication and commitment. Thank you, sir, for being a good teacher for students and for being a model to the fellow teachers. Thank you, sir, for all your guidance and efforts in the successful conduct of this lecture. I thank all the faculty, former faculty members of the college, and especially of the department. We have with us Dr. Abraham George, former principal of the college, Professor Ramani Jol, former HOD, Professor Mary Uman. former jodi and professor susan shila ji who all were with us for this program thank you teachers for your valuable presence i also thank all my fellow faculty members professor arvind shankar and dr vinu govind professor smita elsa saji professor georgi vergis for all their support and concern for the department i sincerely thank all well wishers of the department who used their valuable time to with us to be with us i also thank all participants including students and research scholars of the department for their active participation and support 
let's hope for a brighter future and let's continue with the perseverance to achieve our goals thank you all one second thank you so much all the best and you can all the dream thank you so much thank you thank you sir thank you sir the meeting has been adjourned thank you one and all sashivar sir when yes. your team in noida is over we wish you a happy return program <laughs> <laughs> ൂ ബൈ ബൈ ടേക്ക് കെയർ ആൻഡ് ഓൾ ദി ഫാക്ടറി ബൈ ബൈ താങ്ക് യു താങ്ക് യു സാർ